Hello and welcome to News Click. Professor J N Sai Baba has been convicted by a trial court and has been sentenced life imprisonment for his alleged links with Maoists. To discuss the issue, we have with us Gautam Lavlakha, a eminent human rights activist. Welcome to News Click, Gautam. So, Professor J N Sai Baba, along with five other people, have been convicted by a trial court, and I think four of them have been sentenced life imprisonment. So what do you think? Uh, what what implication would it have? Let's begin with the conviction of six people. Five of them got life imprisonment, and one ten years uh, imprisonment. Vijay from uh, Kanker. Uh, out of them, two are villagers, Adivasis from uh, Gadchiroli. Uh, apart from that, there is a student from JNU, Hem Mishra, Prashant Rahi, uh, a journalist. Uh, from Uttarakhand and J N Sai Baba from Delhi University. Uh, it's interesting if uh, I can just quote an excerpt from uh, the judgment, which shows what is the offence that is being made out against all of them. That they are active uh, members of active members of CPI Maoist and its frontal organisations. Uh, they hatched criminal conspiracy to create violence, to cause public disorder, and to spread disaffection towards the centre and state governments. And were found in possession of printed Naxal literature, circulating information, etc., etc. So it's this is their offence. Now the point is that the that the reason why they're being prosecuted is for their ideology, either their sympathy, their support or membership of an organization, but at the level of ideological alignment. It is this which has been made a criminal offense. And it is this which is being read as connected to political violence, etc., 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 etc. Under normal law, unless you are found to have committed an actual crime, you can't be punished. Here, what under Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, it is possible to convict you on ground of your thought it's, an, uh, it's a kind of a thought policing and criminalization of a certain ideology. It's this which compels the judge, uh, Shinde, to, to also remark. Uh, let me quote again from the judgment, para 1013, which it says, quote, In my opinion, the imp Imprisonment for life is also not a sufficient punishment to the accused, but the hands of the court are closed, so on and so forth, unquote. My point is that left to himself, he would have preferred death penalty for this crime. The warning for us is that the direction in which we are moving is frightening. That a person for, or persons for their ideology, not for an actual crime that they have committed, can be given life imprisonment, which under Supreme Court's own judgment and understanding, life imprisonment means till the end of the one's life. Then Mahesh Tirke, who is 22 years old, Pandu Pore Narot, who is 27 years old, Hem Mishra, who is 32 years old, uh, Vijay Na Tirke is 30 years old, uh, Sai Baba is 47, and uh, Prashant Rahi, 54 years old. Imagine that they are supposed, as far as the trial judge is concerned, that the crime is such and their offences of such, such heinous and grievous nature, although no uh, criminal act has been committed, that they deserve life imprisonment, which means life until the end of one's life. It's frightening. It's a frightening thing. So, not just the conviction on ground of ideology and thought, but also the quantum of punishment itself, both together should be read as a, 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 as a clear indication of what Unlawful Activities Prevention Act means. Let me explain just briefly the difference between the two. Once you invoke Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, then even a normal crime becomes an aggravated crime and the quantum of punishment gets enhanced. So for the same crime under a normal law, the punishment that you get, it gets enhanced if Unlawful Activities uh, Prevention Act or any provision uh, from that act are, are read into it. This is creating a system where the rights of the accused 
and especially in political trials of this nature, because clearly it's a political trial. It's a trial against an ideology. Their persecution and their prosecution is a result of this. Gautam, uh, I would like to also throw some light on the case. Uh, the circumstances under which Sai Baba was first time arrested, police came in plain clothes, they picked him up from a college. Also, the things that they seized from his place, none of them were sealed, which is what their family members are claiming. So, uh, the, they, the court doesn't pay attention to all these things? Obviously, the court has paid attention to it and has refused to accept uh, any of those arguments and contentions. Now, that is as far as, I mean, as far as that legal battle is going to continue because it's going to go into appeal. Even in ordinarily, I mean, any life imprisonment or death penalty automatically goes in appeal to the high, to the high court and the Supreme Court. And given the Supreme Court standing verdict, which has not been overturned, that there is no such thing as guilt by association, that the sheer membership of an organization doesn't amount to a criminal act that you must have actually enacted, been part of a, a criminal, uh, you know, a, a preparing for or have committed a criminal offence that you can be prosecuted. Uh, obviously, this judge uh, doesn't give much, len, you know, credence to what the superior, superior courts have said. So, that legal battle would continue. But let me remind that this is not the first time where UAPA has been invoked, any number of Hindustanis have been arrested for either they are Muslims or they are Dalits, they are Adivasis or left-oriented individuals, including civil liberties activists, social activists, journalists, etc., etc. These are the people who have come under have been uh, where Unlawful Activities Prevention Act has been invoked. The way in which the police investigates, the enormous powers that they enjoy, which they come to then exercise arrogantly, arbitrarily, everywhere, uh, they go beyond their brief. There is a suspicion and in fact there is evidence to suggest that fake charges are filed against any number of people. I mean, look at, if you look at the list of acquittals in the last few years of so many of these people who were accused of being semi crime, uh, who are supposed to be members of semi, which stands banned under Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, or Arun Ferreira, Vernon Gonzalez, Binayak Sen, Narayan Sanyal, Piyush Guha, any number of people who have been, who have been uh, charged under Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, in so many of their cases they have been acquitted, which makes, makes it also clear that very often these, 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 these charge sheets are uh, found wanting, even in terms of, of uh, the evidence that is required. In this particular case, completely going by what he claims is something illegal, which is Naxal literature. Literature cannot be banned. Ideas cannot be banned. Yeah, actually, that was my next question. That can you please throw some light on the Supreme Court judgment that you were recently referring to? Well, they call it Naxal literature because anything connected with an organization which stands banned in the eyes of the authorities, material, the literature of that organization itself becomes a criminal, uh, 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 you know, um, is something criminal. So, in their reading, but the point is, unless you have committed an offense, you can't be. I mean, for instance, the Supreme Court has on umpteen times has explained the difference between advocacy and incitement. You can advocate violence, but you can't incite violence. So, my advocacy of, say, for instance, armed resistance cannot be, is not a crime. But if I incite violence, that becomes criminal. Now, obviously, there is a lot of learning that this judge has to go through to realize, I mean, this is an ideological, political judgment, very clearly. And his orientation is extreme, uh, either chauvinistic, I mean, jingoistic, uh, uh, and uh, uncritical. Uh, given that, it very clearly exhibits the, 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 the predilection of the judge. But that's not the main issue. The point is that these powers are derived from Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. This enormous arbitrary power 
to uh, dish out such sentences and punishment, A to accept the validity of that evidence, then B to, of, uh, the, to uh, give a quantum of punishment disproportionate to the crime in any way, even if it is counted as an offence. It makes it very clear that the powers flow from unlawful activities prevention and act and that is where we must target our attention. How does unlawful activities prevention act define unlawful and terror? That itself is something that must be put to question. Uh, the organization I work for, People's Union for Democratic Rights, we have come out with two reports. One which looks at the histor history of Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, how it came into being, starting with the first amend uh, amendment to the Constitution in 1951, which imposed reasonable restrictions on uh, freedom of speech, association and peaceful assembly, to the time the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act was passed in 67 and then new uh, entire POTA provisions were incorporated in 2004 and subsequently in 2008. It is that history which must be stood. And I would, I would really urge uh, your, your, the people who watch your uh, news click to go to pudr.org uh, and take a look at our reports, Banned and Damned, which looks at, which is a study of how UAP operates when they ban an organization and it is a study of semi struggle for, for, for justice in the tribunals. And the earlier report from 2012 which looks at the history of Unlawful Activities Prevention Act because I think unless we ex accept and recognize that our big battle must be against Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, we will get nowhere because I am 100 percent sure that once it goes to the superior court they stand a good chance of being vindicated and being acquitted of those uh, for what they have been punished, unless I mean unjustly and unfairly. But they are going to remain incarcerated for that long. It can take some time before they come out. But a real battle must be against uh, for release of all those who have been charged under Unlawful Activities Prevention Act and for repeal of Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. It is an abominable, obnoxious, undemocratic black law that uh, deserves not to be a part of it. And if I may add one thing, it is actually it's interesting that what Unlawful Activities Prevention Act does is what the freedom movement always fought against had rejected and it is that legal system which the British Raj used against the freedom movement has been revived, was first revived in form of TADA, then POTA and now Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. So what kind of a country is it? We talk about nationalism, Indianness and uh, we are willing to throw stones and kill each other for over that, but we do not even have the sense of, of history and perspective to understand how an obnoxious law from British Raj, colonial period is being used by post uh, independent governments in this country to throttle uh, our rights, our civil liberties. Thanks a lot Gautam for giving us your time and uh, as these things proceed we will be coming back to you on such issues. Thanks a lot. Thank you for watching News Click.